Hi there, me, your friendly neighborhood humble stroke, stroke assaulter with Crash the Wonderbird. We're doing part two now of um, caregiver self-care after a stroke. That's the working title that could change. So in the last video, we quickly, just going to review, we discussed that spousal caregiving for stroke survivors, there are six elements that present difficulty, that experiencing a profound sense of loss, adjusting to new relationship, taking on new responsibilities, feeling the demands of caregiving, having to depend on others for support, and then maintaining hope and optimism. So if you haven't seen part one to this, please go watch part one and there'll be a bit of a detailed response and, and just discussion about those events. Now we're going to look at the other piece that I, I wanted to spend some time. So there was a study that looked at and the study is the caregiving relationship and quality of life among partners of stroke survivors, a cross-sectional study. Again, I'm going to leave the exact same set of links in the research section down below for both videos. So both videos will have all the exact same links. Um, and at that point, just do your own research. Again, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not licensed or accredited in any way to be a mental health professional, um, you know, or anything. So again, I, I implore everyone, use my videos as a benchmark of information and do your own research so that when you go to your clinical team, you can give them the information and you can have the conversations and discussions that need to have. So since the majority of stroke survivors will return home after their stroke, right, whether that be hospital to home whether that be hospital to rehab facility to home, whether that be hospital, rehab facility, nursing home to home, the majority of stroke folk or brain injured folk will eventually return home. And depending on the funding you have available to you, depending on other resources in your area, generally speaking, it's going to be the family that does the care uh, for that individual. So let's just talk about the relationship and quality of life among partners of stroke folk or in, in brain injured folk, right? So a few studies have investigated the more global considerations of quality of life for the caregivers or a family member of someone who's had a stroke or a brain injury, right? It's, there's not a lot of studies. It, there's, there are some, but there aren't a significant amount of studies. So there's little academic and clinical understanding of how caregiving can influence and impact the family unit, specifically the, the spouse, intimate partner, whatever you want to call it, right? Things such as life satisfaction, psychological and social and physical functioning, right? And, and appreciating the impact on those providing the care. So we need to look at a few things. First one's the quality of the relationship. Next one is equity in the relationship. And then reciprocal exchanges. And I'm going to add a fourth one to that. Uh, effective communication. So the, the study here um, didn't look at effective communication, but I'm going to add a fourth one. So quality of the relationship, right? So... the pairing of the two partners before the stroke, right? You're pretty much on equal terms. The quality of the relationship is equal. Now, because of the stroke, the quality of that relationship cannot be equal. It, when I was working in mental health, I took some courses on family counseling. And one of the people facilitating the counseling or training about family counseling so there's no such thing as a 50-50 relationship in, in any family. It doesn't exist. It cannot exist. Right? The 50-50 the is the myth. It could be 60-40. It could be 70-30. Um, it could be 20-80. It could be 10-90. Right? What's more important is not the percentages that you're at. It's the length of those percentages. So if you're consistently 
at a 70-30 in favor of one person against another, you're not having a relationship that has an equality to it because there's no equality to it. Right? So let's just consider the quality of the relationship because that's going to change drastically right after the stroke. Because right now, you have to look at things like the financial burden. Right? Who used to be the, the predominant economic earner versus who is it now? Um, are the economic influences of that relationship now controlled by a third party? That being your workplace health and safety insurance government organization. Is that through an insurance company? Uh, be it one that you personally have a policy with or one your employer has a policy with, right? Um, are you on some kind of social assistance? Like there are many reasons why the quality of the relationship can change financially. Uh, so I'm back on leave of absence um, due to some complications because of my stroke. Uh, I am fine. Let me just say that I am fine. I'm getting the help that I need. Uh, and so right now I'm going back on benefits. Not a place I want to be, but it's a place I have to be. It's, it's not something I enjoy, but unfortunately, it's a place where I'm, I'm required to be for, for my own health. Right? I, so that now places a burden, right? Because now I'm now waiting for the machinery of the benefit system to play catch up to my reality, right? So because the stroke brings major changes in the transformations of the relationship, right? Do people now look at active helping in relationships and have and, and have mutuality? It's like how how are those people now taking on those roles? So how do the new roles impact the quality of that relationship? That's something you're going to have to address on your own. That's something you're going to have to investigate on your own. How has the quality of your relationship changed because of your brain injury or because of your stroke. Right? Then let's look at equity in the relationship. Right? How how much reciprocity, how much uh, mutual support are there between the stroke folk or the brain injured folk and their their familial care, caregivers? Right? So under understanding um, the reciprocal exchanges between the caregiver and the care recipient. That's what we need to take a look at as a third, uh, or sorry, as a second indicator, right? Equity theory s states that individuals strive to maintain balance be between benefits, that being receive, receiving help and support, and contributions, giving help and support within their relationships. So before the stroke, again, you might have been on a 60-40 day, you might have been on a 50-50 day, you might have been on a 70-30 day. But if you measure it out through a week and through a month, by far and large, you have a, you have about the same number of events of giving help and support as receiving help and support. However, after the stroke, it's not going to be that way. It can't. It just physically can't. So right after my stroke, I'm in a hospital bed. My, my involvement in any relationship is if you want to see me, you have to come to me. I'm not getting out of that bed anytime soon. Um, so how long did that part of the relationship, was that maintained? Was that maintained over six weeks? Was that maintained over six days? Was that maintained over six months? So just the equity of the relationship, just to have access to that individual changes. Right? Then the equity in the relationship changes because the person who's had the stroke or the brain injury their schedule is no longer their own for a period of time. I'm sorry, I can't go for coffee today. I, I have rehab. I'm sorry, I can't go for lunch today. I have rehab. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cancel our plans. I'm having a fatigue moment. right? So again, the equity in the relationship is going to change. And now you have to look at the events of under-benefit versus the events of over-benefit. Right? So... And that, again, is how much are you benefiting from the relationship and people in it, or how much are people benefiting over you? So because there's going to be inequality in the relationship, 
that can create um, create frustration. Right? Uh, frustration is when reality and expectation don't collide effectively. Think of it as a teeter totter, right? Uh, as a level, right? So if you have a, a level of expectation up here, but reality's down here, there's there's frustration and, and negative frustration. So during the first six weeks, six months, one year after your stroke, I'm going to be honest, the relationship is inherently unequal because it's going to have to be. The relationship is going to be drastically unequal in favor of the person who's had the stroke or the brain injury. So you then have to realize that you could become frustrated. You could become angry. Like there's so many negative emotions that could result because of the level of inequality. And because of that, I'm going to advocate that anyone that is supporting someone that's gone through a stroke or a brain injury, seek help. Go to a support group through your local March of Dimes, your local Heart and Stroke Association. If you have a, or what might just be called the Stroke Association, if you're in, say, the UK, um, you may want to go to your um, local church or, or place of worship. You may wish to go to a therapist, you may wish to go to your general practitioner. I'm going to advocate that, that even though the relationship will be on an unequal footing for an unknown period of time, you still need to seek some help for yourself. Right. So, and even though you may not be able to maintain balance in the relationship because it will be inherently unequal, you can help put that balance into perspective so you're not becoming angry at the individual that's had the stroke. You're not becoming frustrated. Right? Um, you're like you're not you're not ruining. Excuse me. You're not ruining a relationship because the stroke has many levels of trauma. Nobody it does. The stroke has many levels of trauma. The, be it the initial trauma of the stroke itself to how it impacts your relationships with others. Now, reciprocal exchanges. This can be a difficult one because in some cases, the person who's had the stroke may not be in a position to be as reciprocal as possible. If you're in your 70s and you've had a stroke, so let's say you're 74, you may not be as able to be reciprocating due to various factors, be it you're physically weak, be it you're mentally frail, be it you're, the, you're suffering through post-stroke neurological fatigue significantly more. Um, if you have um, massive physical deficits and disabilities after your stroke, such as you're in a wheelchair or your family's had to buy you a special bed because you can't get out of it without assistance. Right? So reciprocity can be a difficult thing. And because reciprocity can be a difficult thing, we now get back to you may be having an inherently unequal relationship. Right? So right now I'm off on a leave of absence. I can walk, I can talk, I can feed myself. I still have some right side weakness occasionally. I still have the apraxia, the anomia, the, the aphasia. Um, but I still try to do things when and where I can. Right? Um, such as grocery shopping, such as banking, such as making meals, such as meal preparation, right? I may not be able to have the same level of relationship functionality because I'm back on leave of absence, so it's, I'm not going to work every day um, because I can't. Um, and because I'm not, because I'm not home predominantly all day long, um, I try to do things like have dinner ready have lunch ready. Um, if it's going to be a fairly involved meal, do the meal prep thing, like sort the laundry before we go do laundry, things, things such as that, right? 
So there are some elements where you may have an unequal, unbalanced relationship. And that again works into because of an inability to be reciprocal. And that, that could be for various reasons. That could be you may have a physical limitation. That may be you have a cognitive limitation. That may be you have a sensory limitation. That may be you have a financial limitation. There are many reasons why you may not be exactly reciprocal and because you cannot be exactly reciprocal, you are not being equal. Right? And then the one I'm going to add in that wasn't in the study is communication. Right? Now, caveat, what if the stroke wiped out the communication ability? Because that is a possibility. I have seen that personally. My grandmother had a stroke and it effectively wiped out her ability to communicate. Um, she could talk. Predominantly, it was yes, no, and shit. A bliss board, I don't think would have been effective um, from what I can remember. But she she effectively... It was a lot of pointing and guessing. I'm just going to be honest about that. It was, it was a lot of pointing and guessing. So... For those that have an inability because the stroke has devastated their communication ability, try not to get frustrated because they, they can't effectively tell you what they need. They can't effectively tell you what they want. It's not their fault, right? And, and I, I've been there personally. I know what it's like when there's one of those hospital wheelie trays with, you know, uh, pears and juice and tea and soup and, and all the things on it and someone's pointing and, and you now have to guess are they pointing at the soup nope not soup tea nope not tea um juice nope not juice and it turns out it's nothing on that tray and you have no idea what they mean i've been there so when it comes to communication you need to develop an effective communication style. You need to develop a style of communication that is clear, concrete, concise, and congruent. Right? So you need to be very clear in your communication. Right? Um, you need to be very concrete in your communication. Right? Uh, you need to be concise and it needs to be congruent. So after my stroke, I have difficulty with <clears throat> people changing topics quickly. My brain sometimes can't can't deal with that. Um, you need to be very clear with your communication. You need to be very concrete because sometimes people with stroke they get, they can get confused easily and they can have memory problems. And by having an effective communication style, I also mean a communication style that is not looking for blame, a communication style that is not looking for fault, a communication style that is simply looking and is aiming to achieve expression. Right? So, now what do I mean by that? Glad you asked. What I mean by that is this. I'm going to tell you exactly what I need. And I'm going to tell you exactly what I need from you. And I'm going to tell you exactly why I need that from you. Right? And, and that's not me trying to be demanding. That's not me trying to be difficult. That's me just trying to express to you, hey, listen, I'm in a rough patch. I need this from you, and this is why I need this from you. And then I realize it's up to you to accept what I'm trying to say, right? I, I get that. Um, so at that point, be that as, as it may. But that's that's what I'm gonna say about that is, is you need to a, have an effective communication style between you and your partner. You need to look for the reciprocal exchanges and you need to understand that not every relationship after a stroke or a brain injury is going to be reciprocating, reciprocal, sorry. There will be an imbalance of equity in the relationship because for a while there, there's going to be an, a balance and an equity. And there will be a change in the quality of the relationship. But if... And when you're able to determine that your relationship is, is starting or could be negatively impacted due to the stroke, 
I'm going to, again, implore you to reach out to get the help you need, to reach out for the resources that you might need, to reach out to get the professional assistance and guidance that you need. Be that from a therapist, a social worker, psychologist, psychiatrist, um, occupational therapist, speech and language pathologist, um, physiotherapist, right? There are many reasons why, or sorry, many experts you might be able to seek help from. And on that note, if you happen to be either supporting someone in their post-stroke recovery, real rehabilitation and reintegration journey, I hope you got some benefit out of the video. Please leave some comments down below. If you happen to know someone supporting someone going through the post-stroke journey, please point the video to them. They'll definitely get some advantage out of this. And if you happen to see either in yourself or someone around you, the signs and symptoms of a stroke, that being um, someone who appears to be immediately befuddled, confused, or has a lack of balance. Someone has vision problems. They see it a great, they see in grayscale. They can't see it in one eye. They can only move their eyes in one direction. They you'll see a little dot in the world. Someone who has a facial droop. There's a noticeable slackening of the face, facial muscles. Someone who can't raise both arms equally effectively or at all. Someone who has slurred, stuttering speech, inappropriate word use for a situation or context, has the inability to smile equally effectively or at all. Someone who has general body weakness, weakness on one side, or the inability to stand unaided, please immediately place that person in a position of comfort and dial 911. Something so simple can save a life.